about how the, the rising importance of these cities, they become economic forces in their own right. And so you start to see the ec economic policies manifest. As, as I think you were commenting earlier, trade agreements are made by the central government, the national government, but they're implemented Indeed. by the subnational. And so that puts a lot more burden of responsibility for the subnational leaders to be out there uh, drawing in the investment and, and engaging. And I'd love to hear how you think about that, you know, from that perspective. Well, well, well let, let me begin, Minister. And you could, Nisha, the, the, the issue for us, if you look at an Australian context, through the 80s and the early 90s, we had a wave of economic reform. We floated our dollar, we deregulated de our banks, we dealt with a whole lot of trade and tariff barriers. They were all levers that could only be pulled by a truly national government. If you now look at the next wave of reform, real productivity enhancing reform, they're not so much challenges that can be met at the national level. They're about health, they're about education and skills, about the formation of knowledge and the important application of that knowledge. They're about uh, the implementation of national policy. The big productivity levers, at least in our circumstance, are very much at that sub-sovereign level. Uh, the point I was making earlier on before we came on stage, uh, all too often, and they're a good thing, and Australia's been very successful in recent times to negotiate a number of free trade agreements that are, they have potential that is almost unknown. In, in decades to come, we'll look back, I think, with a real sense of pride that we'll be able to negotiate those, and, and, and an India-Australia free trade agreement will be one of those. We have some things to work through, but we'll get there, I'm very confident of that. The implementation or the realisation of the opportunities that lie within a free trade agreement is always left to firms and to sub-sovereign governments who are about delivering the produce, delivering all the capability that lies underneath realising those free trade agreements. And that, of course, by, by which I mean skills, human capital, and setting the scene, creating the ecosystems where people can then take advantage of all the barriers that have been moved to one, to one side. Uh, you would expect me to be buoyant and optimistic about the role of governments like the one that I lead, but I think it is a truly exciting time in the delivery of agendas set by others formally, but agendas that we play an active role in setting as well. Minister, how do you foresee well, without, that? Without doubt, the making of foreign and security policy is the preserve of the centre. Um, negotiating trade agreements, again, is something that the central government has to do. But I don't see any conflict here. I don't see the uh, cities, and you know, cities don't have walls and they don't have boundaries. Some cities grow into 20 million, uh, 25 million megapolises. Uh, but as the Premier says, uh, the central government can negotiate a trade agreement either bilaterally or a trade deal as part of the multilateral negotiations in the World Trade Organization, or a plurilateral agreement outside, or a free trade agreement between uh, India and ASEAN, India and Australia, whatever. But it still has to be implemented. Now, much of that implementing gravitas is provided by economic actors strewn all over the country. And that's where the city-state city, city state becomes important. In the, in the case of India, I mean, I'm aware of uh, Gujarat conducting uh, vibrant Gujarat summit since 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gujarat is not the only state in India which is uh, trying to attract foreign direct investment. They're doing very well at it. I mean, other states are doing it. And I don't want to name them in, because I'm mean, a central minister. I, I don't want to be doing, doing the grading. But some are doing it more successfully, others are. And I think that fits into the kind of cooperative federalism that the Prime Minister has outlined. So my response to that is, I do not visualize the states or the city-states doing anything which would appear to run counter to, of, in which there would be a discord in terms of the agreements negotiated by the center. Clearly, foreign and security policy in our constitution, as I believe, yes. Premier and yours, is the preserve of the central government. But within that, you have to make economic processes work. Now I come to another aspect, if I have your uh, permission. Please. You know, you're talking about cities which become global cities. They are part of what I call the global value chain. Now you have a city which uh, uh, undertakes, let's say, production 
Uh, let's take uh, San Francisco and the West Coast. That's one. You take other big cities, London, Paris, uh, New York. I mean, you might have the central government located there. In London, Paris, and um, let's say Moscow, New York, I still don't know where it is located. I mean, I, if you permit me, whether it's in Washington, New York, but I think just now it's in Washington. But let me come back to that. Surely the city of London has a very important role to play. The mayor has a very ro important role to play. But I'm sure the mayor, if he belongs to the same party as the central government, uh, he or she will be taking extra step. You occasionally get uh, governments which belong to different political persuasion, and we have a case like that, where they try to do policy independently, but I think that the people, you know, the mass is wiser than the, uh, you know, they take over. But I think in the coming years, you will find economic actors in cities, city-states, through trade agreements of the kind that Premier mentions, but I think also other global processes becoming more and more important. And I think the central government, as is the case in India, will be taking extra care to involve the states, both for the staging of events and for the acceleration of economic processes. Nisha, there's an interesting given that the minister mentioned the United States. Uh, there's an interesting example in recent times following the United States withdrawal from the Paris Agreement targets. We saw, I'm not sure what the collective noun would be, but we saw many, many governors, uh, to give a few examples, the governors of New York, California, uh, Washington State, many others, stand up and say, well, we as sovereign states, we will play our part to meet those targets as if that national decision had not been uh, taken. That's one example. Uh, increasingly there may be more and more of those examples and that maybe tests a little bit the notion that some areas are clearly the province of the national government and others can be left uh, to the private sector or to sub-sovereign governments or indeed cities. That tension climate is... Change, climate change clearly is an important yeah. uh, multilaterally negotiated instrument in which the stakeholders are not just the government, citizens, etc. Exactly. So the mayors and governors and others in response, I think, that's my understanding, to the aspirations of their own citizens on whom they are dependent for support, uh, if they see a step being taken by the central government, yes, they'll articulate a position which is different. 